okay and let's okay hello everyone and thank you so much for uh participating in our june uh health and environment committee meeting we have um a big agenda as usual and so we want to um get started uh now which is and generally generally we do start pretty much on time with a good turnout i just have to make sure my members are here um and they are uh you'll see names of dr edwin torres the honorable monique hardin cordero the honorable heather jason the honorable patricia ramos i'm not sure if patricia's on right yes, now she, yes she is yeah. oh okay hi patricia um hi. <laughs> and then public members, the Honorable Miriam Aristide Ferrer and the Honorable Monica Dula, who are all board members as well. So uh, can we, you all have a copy of the agenda uh, among the committee members, will you um, either move to accept the agenda as put unless there's some changes or uh, additions or anything to be deleted that you might see. Um, let me just add that uh, the last agenda that was going to be a final included uh, Dr. Movin, you know what, I don't have her full name in front of me. I just talked to Susie about her. Um, anyway, you did not get that agenda. So uh, the one you have should have added in um, New York City Department of Mental and Health uh, of Health and Mental uh, Health, uh, Pat Moore John, Kamita Padilla, and Juanit Rodriguez from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health. Uh, Ms. Charlene Gordon was already on the initial agenda. So that's the one we should be looking at. Uh, I think Ed, when you have the you have the um, first one up, not the second, the revised. The revised is on this. Well, you know what? Let me send it to you. Um, I can see if I can share it with you. Um, for for uh, for uh, yeah. oh, that would be. That uh, would yeah, be great. I think I have it up. Yeah. Um, let me see. I sent it to it? the committee. Right. But Edwin may have missed it because he's uh, in transit. Oh, okay. I can't share, <laughs> so I, I don't you have can. to. Oh, share. I have to make you a co-host. Whatever works for okay, the team. Monique, <clears throat> make a co-host. Okay, there you are, Monique, co-host. Okay, I didn't see anything, but let me see if I can share. Okay, hold on. So while that's being set up. Um, Okay. That was the only addition to the agenda. Is there anything I else? Think, that is, this, is this a proper agenda? Uh, it looks like it. Yes, Fair? it is. Okay. It is, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so you wanted a motion to start the meeting? Uh, not to start. We are, we're already started. Uh, but to accept the agenda with the additions of, uh, well, now that you have the actual um agenda up everyone should see it and then uh it should include uh lewis bailey when we're talking about the junior scientist program so that would be the only addition can can i have a motion to accept the agenda as amended um i move to accept the agenda uh the agenda as amended i second can i get a sec was that heather no patricia, patricia. Patricia, thank you. For, um, so it's been properly moved by Monique and seconded by Patricia to accept the agenda. Um, and if the committee would um, unmute your mics, then we can move faster. We have the minutes that were circulated on this past uh, Friday. Uh, I'm not sure if there are any um, changes. So I'll, I'll put a motion to so accept the minute. Okay. And a second? Second. 
Okay, properly moved uh, by Dr. Torres and seconded by Monique Hardin Cordero. All those in favor of adopting the minute say aye. That's our aye. 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 And I always have to say, uh, you know, a great hearty thanks to Patricia Ramos for just taking on the challenge of doing the minutes. They have been superb and on schedule um, without any problems. Uh, it's just been wonderful to have that kind of support. As a matter of fact, I think we have just the best committee uh, in total on the community board. Of course, I'm sure there'll be those who will say theirs is as well, uh, but we have a terrific group. So thank you again. I second um, that chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, there were some emails that I sent out um, related to uh, Link 5G technology, various health uh, seminars and events. I hope when you see um, the community board's names attached that you will open those um, emails because some of the events and, and activities around healthcare and health awareness are really fantastic. And it seems like I have so much on my plate that uh, it's too hard to attend all of the events, but uh, go back to the emails uh, most of them were um, hybrid, so the virtual. So just see if you can get a recording, which is what I'm going to do, just in case you weren't able to um, participate. Um, look through your emails. There will be um, a hearing or presentation related to the city council uh, regarding the link 5G and technology. Um, I believe their first event takes place uh, tomorrow, two to four. And so that's on technology and I believe it's at city council. So you uh, try to listen in. There was a meeting with the mayor or his representative, uh, also the office of telecommunications with the city, which I attended one meeting, but I wasn't able to attend this latter one. So hopefully we can get an update um, and keep you informed, which is what we try to do with our updates section, uh, which is devoted to current pressing issues in the community and those where we have resolutions. Uh, so if we can uh, start, I saw Ms. Deborah Pang, and I'm not sure, I think I saw Tyra Singleton's name, and I believe Dr. Sharon Krensky. Um, are you available for your presentation? And uh, the person needing to present slides, I can make you a co-host. I will take Monique Hardin Cordero okay. off of co-host, I think. It's um, Sharon Krinsky Mikhail. You can you can do it for me. I'm going to give the presentation. Okay, Dr. Krinsky Mikhail make co-host. Laquita, yes. put the 5G information in the chat for people if they want the information. Oh, thank you, Lewis. That's thank important. You, Lewis. Thank you so um, very much. And while we give um, uh, the co-hosts, uh, um, you know, it's, it's important for folks to follow up on this because, you know, we know historically what has happened environmentally in our government. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of good questions that are being brought up about this new technology and having it close to where humans are habitating. Yes. We encourage everyone to just pay attention to see what's going on um, because this can have an impact on the wider community. Absolutely. And I've, um, I don't know, as the meeting goes on, I'll check uh, the role just to see if someone is here from the Link 5G and they can also give a, a 60 second uh, follow up. Thank you, Dr. Torres. Are you ready, Dr. Krinsky Mikhail? Yes, I am. Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, I just have to, because this is technology that sometimes doesn't work. Um, let me see if I can start my slideshow. Okay, just, and while you're doing that, um, 
Doctor, well, the research is from the New York State Institute for Basic Research in Developmental Disabilities and Columbia University Irving Medical Center are looking mm -hmm. at the association between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. They are in the process of recruiting individuals with Down syndrome to participate in this study. So when we bring people before our uh, committee, we're often uh, seeking information and uh, seeking solutions, but this is also an opportunity for us to be part of the solution. So um, they'll provide us with follow-up information in case there's a participant or other uh, that they may want to, or you may want to recommend. Okay, now, I think Dr. Prinsky Mikhail is set up. Okay, so uh, to give you a little background, the New York State Institute for uh, Basic Research and Developmental Disabilities and also the Columbia Presbyterian Complex are part of a, of a, 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 co a consortium called the Alzheimer Biomarker Consortium in Down Syndrome. And we're considered the New York metropolitan area site because we do recruit also in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, just to give you a little background, the New York State Institute for Basic Research, located on Staten Island, is dedicated to diagnosing, treating, and preventing intellectual and other developmental disabilities. Um, at Columbia Presbyterian, we're also part of the Gertrude H. Sergieski Center in conjunction with the Taub Institute for Research on Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain. And that brings together Columbia University researchers and clinicians to uncover the causes of Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, and other age-related brain diseases, and to discover ways to prevent and cure these, these diseases. So together, we are expanding cognitive neuroscience with comprehensive neuropsychological assessment and imaging technology to study brain behavior relationships in health and in disease. So as I said to you, we're part of this consortium. There are approximately um, eight, eight sites that are doing the same thing that we're doing. We're across the country, as you can see by the other sites. And we even have one site in Cambridge in the UK. And uh, we are funded, we are a longitudinal study funded by the National Institutes of, on Aging, the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and the National Institutes of Health. And the goal of what we're calling APCDS is to follow a cohort of adults with Down syndrome over time to identify early biomarkers that may herald the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And we hope that these biomarkers will be useful to inform clinical trials and improve the quality of life for people with Down syndrome and for people in the general population. Just to give you a very brief overview of what Down syndrome is, it is the most prevalent genetic cause of intellectual and developmental disability. It is caused by an error in cell division where the embryo uh, will have three copies of chromosome 21 instead of the usual two. And you can see in the upper right-hand corner, that's a karyotype. And uh, you can see the red circle that shows you the three copies of chromosome uh, 21. So there, are, there is good news and there's some associated challenges. Adults with Down syndrome are living longer, healthier lives because of improved medical care, technology and environmental conditions. But that means we now have a new challenge of caring for a population with little experience or research data. In this graph, this is the cumulative incidence of dementia in adults with uh, Down syndrome. And you can see that by the time an adult with Down syndrome is about 70 years of age, about 90% of them will have developed dementia that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. So many of them, if they live that long, will show Alzheimer's disease. And we begin to see it sometime in the mid to late 50s. There's a wide range of onset. Um, but if they live to old age, most of them will have Alzheimer's disease. 
I want to just point out this particular slide, and this is the median age of death for persons with Down syndrome by race in the United States between the years 1968 and 1997. So most studies of survival in persons with Down syndrome have focused on white populations, and very little information is available about possible disparities among racial groups. So you can see that white individuals with Down syndrome are living a lot longer than individuals that are of color. I'm gonna bring this up later. So why is there this association between Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome? Well, the gene that uh, contributes to depositing amyloid in the brain, and amyloid is one of the neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, and it gunks up the brain and causes cell death. Well, the gene that contributes to the depositing of beta amyloid is located on chromosome 21. And in this slide, you can this is a uh, an allele of chromosome 21, and you can see the gene APP. And um, individuals with Down syndrome have three copies of this gene. So we only have two copies. So therefore, they overexpress. They make more of this APP. Um, triplication and therefore overexpression of APP seems to be related to the increased risk of Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. So it is very important in the treating and preventing of Alzheimer's disease. We need to know who is at high risk. We need to know when to start treatment and we need to know what pathway to target. So I mentioned beta amyloid, but there are other uh, neuropathological changes that occur in the brain. So we need to know which pathway to target with uh, pharmaceuticals. Our particular study objection, uh, objectives is to examine the course of biomarker changes with age, to identify a possible set of biomarkers that signal the future onset of either mild cognitive impairment, that's MCI, and that precedes uh, dementia of the Alzheimer's variety, identify possible protective factors, identify a set of neuropsychological measures that signal earliest de de deficits, and also to provide targets for future treatment trials. So what we are looking for are adults with Down syndrome who are 25 years of age and older. And again, the Down syndrome, um, we, we only are looking in this study uh, with individuals with Down syndrome as opposed to other types of developmental disabilities. Um, we prefer that they do not have a current diagnosis of dementia, except for those that have been in the study long term. Uh, we are asking for participants with a mental age of over 36 months, again, except those that are, are currently in the study. And that's because people that have that the um, mental age of over 36 months are able to do some of the memory tests and visual spatial tests that we ask them to do as part of a comprehensive evaluation. So we want them to be able to participate in cognitive testing and also to have a blood draw. So one of the things, as I mentioned to you very early on, is that it is very difficult. Um, most of these studies, participants are, uh, are, from, are white. And we do not know necessarily if, if Alzheimer's disease appears differently in individuals that are not white. Um, there seems to be a reluctance to participate in research for a number of reasons. NIH has put in a lot of money into a core of our program, which is called the Alzheimer's Disease and Down Syndrome Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement. We call it the ADORE Core. Um, it is to, so what our goals are for the ADORE Core is to increase community literacy about brain aging, Alzheimer's disease, and Down Syndrome. We want to generate and disseminate educational materials regarding the importance of research and research methods targeting Alzheimer's disease in adults with Down syndrome. We want to generate and disseminate educational materials regarding brain aging and, and Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome to underserved communities 
near all the ABCDS clinical sites. And we want to increase, increase recruitment of individuals with Down syndrome into the ABCDS cohort from diverse populations. Uh, that is all I prepared tonight. I figured you'd have uh, a lot of questions because I did go through this rather quickly. But if you have any questions or concerns that come to you after uh, this uh, presentation, please feel free to contact myself. Um, uh, or uh, Tyra Singleton or Deborah Pang. Uh, Tyra and Deb are our Adore Core coordinators, and they're very active in recruiting individuals with Down syndrome. And again, thank you so much for allowing us to um, present at your meeting tonight. It looks like you have a very full agenda, so I'll I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Krinsky, Mikhail. Um, that was really enlightening, very easy to, to follow. It's still a lot of material. Are there, uh, oh, and we just appreciate your uh, reaching out to us to present this information and uh, use us as a resource to try to recruit. Are there any questions from um, anyone uh, in our audience? Of course, you can put questions in the chat or just use the raise hand feature. How would someone go about um, learning more about participating if they have a child um, or you know an mm -hmm. adult child or a relative with Down syndrome and uh, or know someone or has an organization with participants uh, who possibly you know, could get agreement, um, you know, for participation and to research data. How would they go about that? Uh, they can either contact myself and I can put um, my information in the chat or they can contact uh, Deborah Pang or, or Tyra Singleton. We are also though on social media. I somehow, I think I deleted that slide, but if you just type in ABCDS, we will come up. And uh, it has, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say, Tyra just put into the chat our social media, I guess, handles. Um, also, as I think Dr. Christy McHale was about to say, if you just Google ABC-DS, uh, the links to the website that NIH has uh, created, as well as uh, the lead site, which is out of the University of Pittsburgh, those links should come up as well. And on the on those web pages, it does have a section about recruitment and it'll give you to a page where it li uh, lists all the different sites, which includes our New York site. So our New York site is listed twice, one as the uh, New York State Institute for Basic Research and also as Columbia University. And there are the links within those to email the coordinators. And what would be a representative number for a valid or, or comprehensive research? What kind of number are you looking at? 100? Well, each, each site is trying to recruit about 80 participants. What, in, in theory, in the best of all possible worlds, you would like representation to be the same as it is in the population. So we should have, in fact, more people in the New York site than maybe in the Madison, Wisconsin site for people of color. For instance, so you so uh, you know theoretically, when you learn about research methods, they tell you it should be the same representation as people are in the population. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Let me. Uh, well, a lot was just put into the chat. Let me just make yeah. sure. Hello, everybody. My camera isn't working, so you can't <laughs> see me. Um, I'm Tyra Singleton. I'm the one that's been in contact with uh, Ms. Laquita. How you how you feeling? Hi, Ms. Singleton. Um, I also feel like, um, especially um, coming from the Black and Brown community myself, that you know we have been affected the most um, negatively by studies and how we associate scientific studies. And I understand the fear that we've had because of the injustices that we have been um, served <laughs> in a way. 
Um, but also I feel like it's a big injustice to us as well to not be involved because we're not being represented in the numbers. And so it's a double-edged sword that it's very hard to wield, but I would rather we are more um, involved in studies and that if problems happen along the way, they can be corrected and made better and it can be more suited and tailored to us. And that's it. And also with the files in the um, the chat, I'm sorry, I thought the PDF would come up better, but now I'm realizing now I should have saved them on SharePoint. So if we ever do this again, uh, it'll be it'll look way more better. <laughs> Thank you. You did fine. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you so much for saying that. Um, early on in uh, 2022, Dr. Torres and I uh, were talking about this whole thing, and especially Dr. Torres pressed the point of trying to get uh, people in the black and brown community to participate more in research. And that's why we've started uh, and have us a part of most of our sessions of, of this year. Uh, the clinical trials so that uh, we can get the word out as to what goes on, and, you know, from the researchers themselves, at least get some uh, sense of how that research is conducted, what it can tell, and then ultimately how it can benefit all of us, but particularly people of color. And you stated it very well, Ms. Singleton, and that oftentimes uh, we complain that uh, studies don't include us and that it is true that they don't some have not sought us out but that's hopefully changing and that community board nine can be a part of that change so uh among us and our committee uh and among the groups that uh come and present to us those that are um uh on uh as participants with us today perhaps there are um social groups for those with Down syndrome, um, those that we know, uh, ways that we can help get the word out to, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, in a, uh, among people, it's a sensitive, you know, issue, but we'll find ways to talk to them and you can find ways to talk to them to see if you can, we can encourage participation so that we should be able to get 80 yeah, people would, participating. I would add to this, Aquita, that um, this is very important to have a diverse community because of the genetic pool that we have. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in blood pressure management, certain medications they work better for African Americans versus white versus Asian. So that is that is data that we already know. When it comes to you know dementia and Alzheimer, um, this is something that uh, we want to understand, especially in our community. So if you know there are better you know some treatment that can better treat our population that we can find out through these studies. Yes. Yeah. And just so you know, in a very short time, we expect they're going to start a clinical trial with adults with Down syndrome on some of the drugs that are available now to fight Alzheimer's disease. So mm -hmm. we want we want to get as much uh, information out there as we possibly can. And especially now that adults with you know Down syndrome, they're living longer. So we yes. want to make sure they stay as functional as possible in our community. Um, so we can make sure they live a you know full um and healthy life. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a it's a very big change. Uh back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, you know, parents were told to put their children, their infants in institutions because mm -hmm. he was gonna the child was gonna die young anyhow, don't get attached. And many of those children now are living to be in their 60s and 70s. So mm -hmm. things have changed just so broadly. Yes, I, I when I was a teenager, I babysat for someone who had Down syndrome, and he has outlived his parents. Yes, yes, that does so happen. He's outlived his parents. Thank you again, and I don't, and I know Edwin will help like, me. We, have, we, have, we have, Heather has her hand up, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, because I didn't see that. Sorry, Heather. That's okay, I'm having an issue with my voice, but how long is the study, um, and then the time commitment for participation and are, are there any incentives 
being offered yes. for the study? Yes. So for now, um, the study is running five years, but the study, so every five years you have to go and put in a new application to NIH. And so we have been doing studies like this for since since the 1980s, um, although the three of us haven't been involved in the study that long, but it has been going on. So we're hoping that this will go on until there is a cure for Alzheimer's disease in this population. Okay. But for now, it is um, about five years. Uh, we see individuals uh, once every 18 months, but then there are a number of procedures and tests that they can go through. Of course, you should know that everything is voluntary. Um, we ask that people, though, uh, go through the neuropsychological testing. We go through their medical charts to look at diagnoses and medication usage. We interview their caregivers to find out everyday functioning. We hope that uh, they will all give at least one sample of blood. We would like them all to be able to at least do an MRI uh, that, tell, that shows us while they're still living, what changes are going on in the brain. And then for a subsample of participants, we're asking them to do PET scans and lumbar punctures. But that is a very, that is um, fewer participants um, and New York State places certain regulations on, on who is eligible for these other voluntary procedures. And so, um, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. So, so it might take um, two or three days every eighteen months, every 18 but it months. all depends on um, on what procedures uh, families and the participant consent and assent to. Um, as far as um, incentives, individuals are paid for their time. It's very important. Many of our uh, adults have have jobs and they get paid by the hour and they're missing out. So we do have money to pay them. Uh, Deb can tell you more about um, the pay schedule. It is, we think it's very fair and most people, most of our participants are very pleased by it. Um, I have to tell you, we've had success over the last, I've been involved in it in the last 25 years and people that participate are us usually find this enjoyable. And are you partnering with the Young Adult Institute to um, secure? At the, at the moment, no. At the moment, no. Um, and that's only, we're having great difficulty getting participation. And it's it's one of the, the um, tragedies of COVID uh, that many of these social service agencies are uh, short of staff. Okay. And what, what we have is a lot of times someone from an individual's group home will bring them to Columbia. Well, now the group home can't spare that individual to be at Columbia from, you know, nine to three. So, no, at the moment, we're not the Young Adult Institute, but we do work with AHRC. And Deb is better at rattling off all the different agencies that we are currently involved with. Yeah, because they're they're a wonderful organization that would yeah, seem to provide you know excellent candidates for this study. Yes. Okay. Yes. Have, Thank you so much. Yeah. Just so you know, Miss Jason, we have worked with YAI in the past. It's just that yes. this time around, with the shortage of staffing, it was it's a lot yes. of work to you know they have to go through their files and figure out who's eligible, who would be eligible, and contact right. with families, and and so it's a lot of follow up. So um, and we understand that because it it's been the past few years, actually just before COVID, um, our previous study, um, the, that's when New York State transitioned their care coordination system. And so all the agencies were in a scramble trying to reorganize and do everything. So um, the shortage of staff was happening even before COVID, but it really hit after COVID. But all the agencies we've been working with, that even if they're unable to work with us, have been very kind and very understanding. And when they can help us, they're very, uh, very, very helpful. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you from all of us. Chair, we have Chair. Monique on um, Laquita. Oh, yeah. Monique, okay. Sorry, Chair, this very quickly. Dr. Singleton, once again, I said thank you um, for the work your team is doing. Um, and I don't know if you are um, uh, touched upon this and forgive me because I had to uh, turn away for a second. The chart that you had shown with that big disparity between 
-hmm. those who are white living with Down syndrome versus those um, I, that graph, I guess, showed black. So a uh, black um, patients with Down syndrome. Have you begin? Have you begun to look at why that difference might be occurring? Uh, have you begun to look at or speculate, or you're waiting to get more information from, I guess, having more participants? Um, that's partly it. Is getting is getting more participants, but no. Um, we had not conducted that study. That study others had conducted. So I would have to look into that, into some of the the reasons why um, we think that this might be happening. I see. Okay. Very and certainly, good. if you notice that it did stop at like nineteen, uh, I forgot what nineteen ninety three. Uh, that was uh, a long time ago, so things might have changed since then. But people, have, but there's no other studies that have looked at this particular issue. Yeah, I did notice that it seemed like it. Yeah, that was quite some time ago. So of course, yeah. I'm hoping those numbers are different. Though we know Absolutely. those disparities yeah. still exist. So yes. it was a great thing that you guys are doing, and I reiterate to other community board members, um, thank you for sharing. Thank you very much. I, I and, and Dr. Krinsky, Mikhail, yeah. um, yes, we'd like for you to come back uh, to do a follow-up uh, sure. when you think you're ready for, it doesn't have to be, well, obviously it's not going to be a complete completed study, but you might have uh, something that you'd like to share. Oh, uh, absolutely. More recruits, and it doesn't have to be an entire presentation, just maybe a, an up some update. Oh, absolutely. We would love to. And any recruitment material that is also in Spanish, if you guys can send it to us. Okay. Um, yes, we, we can large, do that. Uh, you know, Latino speaking community uh, population in our community. Yes. Yes. And we do have um, materials in, in Spanish. Thank you. All righty. So as we move forward. Um, good night, everyone. Good Thank night. You. Good night. Um, we have the New York City Department of Health and Mental Health here. I know I saw Juanit Rodriguez's name uh, before we get to Charlene. Um, uh, Juanit, uh, do you have a couple of uh, introductions and um, updates for us? Yes, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, do you like need uh, to be made a co-hoster? for your uh, slides or anything like that? Uh, no, it's okay. I think for the purpose of this meeting, um, I, I okay, want to give so enough just, time for Charlene to, to present. Yes, yes, okay. Go ahead, please. So I just wanted to briefly introduce myself again. So my name is Juani Rodriguez. I'm the COVID Community Engagement Coordinator at the Harlem Health Action Center. Um, I think that my, our new executive director is also joined onto this call, Carmita Padilla. Yes, I'm here. Yes. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we just wanted to give take this time to just introduce ourselves again. Um, I will be transitioning out of this role at the end of the summer, but um, Carmita, who's on this call, will be in charge of putting someone who will be attending these meetings. So there will always be representation from the Action Center here. And yeah, that that's um, all of the updates or the main updates that we had. I don't know if I'm missing anything, Carmita. I think that's it. Thank you. I thank you for giving us time. Uh, this is my first meeting and I, I just joined the uh, Harlem Bureau six weeks ago and I wanted to join and be part of this. So um, while we need transitions, I'm available. I know you also know Pat Moore John, of course, he's available, but we'll be your contacts and we will make sure someone's attending these regularly. So good to meet you. Thank you so much. Will you drop your contact information in the chat or uh, yes. email me because it will be important for me to have uh, even a telephone number yes. uh, also as follow-up as yep, well I'll as the that. email. I'll email okay. you and I'll put it on the chat bow. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, Charlene Gordon, I have made you a co-host uh, for your update on um, education and community partnerships and activities going on. Uh, from your department of um, within the Department of Health and Mental Health. Aquita, I had a quick question in regards to COVID. Oh, um, 
I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm glad you spoke out because sometimes I can't see the hands or yeah, anything like they, that. They, they okay. Some report that um, uh, they have, you know, noticed an increased amount of the virus in the in the sewer. Does the Department of Health has anything for CB9 in regards to this? That should be for Juanit or Carmita Padilla. Unfortunately, I have not heard this information. Um, and yeah, I don't have any updates regarding this, but I can definitely make sure that I make it a, a note and not update this. Um, please, uh, yes, if you guys can, because uh, one of the ways that we monitor COVID is through uh, monitor the sewer, and if, they, if we're having any presence of the virus, um, so if you know if CB9 is experiencing this, it will be good for us to know, um, because sometimes this is the first sign of seeing an uptick in the virus. Of course, and I think that all of this information is also um, uh, live um it's updated regularly on our website and which i can share into the chat as well um but yeah i as of right now i haven't heard of an uptake but i can definitely make sure to double check and you know or follow up with this and i may have missed it but wandi will you put that information in the chat because there are a number of people here who are not on our committee but are involved with other uh organizations and associations and uh, may want to refer to that data as well. Yes, of course. So the data, um, I'm going to share it into the chat, um, and it's separated by neighborhoods. So um, I think we our most recent information is on there. Okay. Um, so moving forward, um, Charlene A. Gordon, um, are you ready? Yes. I made you a co-host so that you can uh, use your slides. So, okay. And I appreciate all the assistance you've provided in the last uh, week and over the months when you offered, uh, when you guys were here last and presented to come back when you had something going on. I appreciate your follow through on that. Okay. So uh, we welcome uh, the activities and if you can uh, tell us, you know, briefly what's uh, happening with you guys now, what you're oh. presenting to the public. Okay, so I'm going to share um, some slides. Uh, hopefully, everyone can see it. Yes. Okay. All righty. So it's um, my name is Charlene Gordon. I am um, from the New York City Department of Health, but I represent the um, environmental disease and injury prevention area. And within that, I'm from the Education and Community Partnership Unit, which we do a lot of education out to the community, um, educating them about the different environmental home health hazards in their home. So I'm actually here today to just um, share with you what are, you know, we're doing a lot of activities for this month. For some reason, my slide is not moving. Let me try again. Okay, let me do full screen. Okay. All righty. So just to recap, um, our Bureau's mission, um, our mission, the mission of the Bureau of Environmental Disease and Injury Prevention is to prevent environmental disease and injury in homes, community, and the workplace, and to protect health by promoting healthy environments and health equity. So what I did was I looked at, um, we have a data portal um, that's online, that's open to the public. Um, this portal on the health department site um, gives you um, information about the environmental, um, you know, different hazards um, to about your neighborhood. So I looked at the neighborhoods where this community board actually um, covers which is, it shows up at Central Harlem, which covers Morningsides and a number of the zip codes that you do um, represent. So when I looked, I search under environmental, um, you know, issues in homes, um, these three categories actually share, um, came up. One, looking at health outcomes, and um, our home safety and maintenance and indoor air quality. 
So when we look at health um, outcomes, you know, we look to see how they are um, versus all the different neighborhoods in New York City or in all five boroughs versus, you know, that particular neighborhood. So when we looked, um, you know, things that came up that's worse is on like asthma and um, hospitalization, both for children and adults. Um, so, you know, I just wanted you to kind of see, you know, what's happening as far as your neighborhood. When we look at home safety and maintenance, that's an area where we do a lot of education out to the community about. Um, and when we look, we see, you know, all the different topics that comes up. And we, as you can see in that diagram, it's, um, it's not, it doesn't look good. Um, so, um, some of it, um, we need to do a lot of education out to the community. We need to, you know, let folks know, um, the sun this phone ring. Yeah. If folks know, um, where they need to, um, you know, get information. Um, so when you look, you see the cracks, the peeling paints, the leaks, supplemental heat, carbon monoxide, household with AC and maintenance problem. So as I said, this is just compared to the other neighborhoods in New York City. Then we look at indoor air qualities, which describe um, potential sources of allergens and pollutants um, um, that can worsen someone's asthma, because you see asthma is a, a big issue here in, in this particular area. And we see it's worse as far as smoke-free homes, um, mold, cockroaches, and mice it's middle, but still, we still have to um, share some information to, to the, um, the residents in this area. So it could get better. So with that saying, our resources, um, one of the couple of things that we do, as, as I mentioned earlier, with the education and community partnership units, you know, we provide workshops virtually and in person um, to parents, pregnant women, um, tenants, etc. We also do talks to seniors, um, older adults. Um, we do staff trainings um, at various agencies or any organization is interested in having one of our topics um, to talk about. Um, we also have some professional trainings or if a community organization is, is geared to, um, there's two types. One geared to any agency that deals with families. And we also have agency dealing with the older adult population. In addition to the talks, we also have educational materials available in a number of languages. I heard someone was talking and saying, do you have materials in Spanish? But yes, we do have some um, educational materials in about um, 14 different languages. We also have an information line that folks can call and um, get information. And we also participate in health fairs and tabling events um, as um, you know, we get it and to see if other staff are um, interested in volunteering to go. So that's um, ways of how we get our education out to the community. Um, these are the topics we cover. Um, as you can see, it's a slew of topics. Um, it can range from lead poisoning, um, bed bugs, window guards, false prevention, safe gardening, mold, et cetera. So yes, these are some of the topics that we have staff that could actually facilitate and to educate the community. Um, we do it in English and Spanish. And we also, we just currently hired someone that's Spanish speaking. So the person is actually in training. Um, we do have someone that speaks Bengali and Russian, one of our health educator. And as far as Chinese, we have, we partner with our poison control center, which is part of our um, division. And um, that particular person, they do, um, are trained to do talks on our healthy homes overview, which touches on like five tips and how to prevent your home from, you know, with these hazards. These are ways that you could connect with us. Um, if you're interested in any of those talks, you can either go online, um, you can email us, or you can actually give us a call. So yeah, so these are the three ways that you can actually connect with us. These are some educational materials that we have out. We do have an order form that you can go online and get and fill it out. It's double-sided. 
and um, you put how many you need um, and what language you want the materials in. And hopefully you take that information and disseminate it out to the community um, so they can be educated and help them, you know, preventing um, some of the environmental hazards that's occurring. Okay. We also have a um, ES ESOL curriculum. It is basically for agency that offers ESL program to introduce um, the topic around LAD to the students during the time when they're um, doing a session, especially if they're doing something on health and safety. So, you know, it's great. Um, it's online and it's free. Um, there's a facilitator guide, then there's an activity guide, and it has some examples. It has, um, you know, different um, activity things that agency can um, incorporate in their curriculum. We also have a monthly newsletter that we have that um, when you attend one of our workshops or we come across or connected with someone, we put it in a, a database that we have. And when we have these um, newsletter out, you, you do get it. And we're hoping you also take these newsletter and disseminate it out to the groups that you're working with. It's, it's a great tool. It's also, um, Good reminder and you know we have to find ways of educating our community residents this is our information line um it is available monday to friday um from 8 30 to 4 30 where you know we have staff um available to ask questions and uh as to to answer your questions and for folks to just call in and you know just maybe just asking a question about around lead or sometimes we do get some calls um, about topics that um, doesn't pertain to what we cover, but we try our best to, um, to direct them to the appropriate areas. And if you're interested in also to connect with us, um, do you know doing a presentation or maybe just ordering, you can still call the line for that. Um, we always, always um, encourage um, and hoping to collaborate. Um, so we also have to share that with you that we are available to collaborate with you to, you know, to get the um, messages out to the community. One of the ways you can also do is you can also request, you know, presentation if you're from an agency or you know of any groups um, that could value from this information within the community. Um, you know, you can always connect with us. There's a contact person and you can reach out to her, leave a message so they could coordinate a day and time. And um, ordering, just ordering educational materials and, you know, get it disseminated out. If you're having a um, resource fair or if you're, you know, you have an office and you want to make sure that the community is aware of these things, just ordering it and just have it posted in, you know, in the area. And the third and lastly is you can always connect with us to just um, discuss ways or strategies of how we can actually get all of this um, out to the community. So we have um, a monthly, um, we have this a monthly webinar during 2020 COVID, you know, we were able to do a lot of um, workshops. So we started to do some virtual webinars and we have continued to see it's still working um, and it's always open um, to the community. Um, there's a schedule. Every month we have new topics. Um, there's the link in the bottom. It is a um, link for this entire year. You go on there and um, we update the schedule. Currently the schedule is not updated for June as yet but will be by the end of this week, um, we'll have the schedule um, up that we have for, planned for June. But you can always, you know, um, if your phone, use the QR code and see what we have um, coming up. That's a way to um, also spread the information out to the community and to get them engaged. And one of the things with those webinars is that when you attend and you do get a certificate for attending the webinar and it's free. You know? So this is what we have coming up for this um, month. So just to let you know that this month is, it's called Healthy Homes Month. And it's, um, it's around the principle of, you know, um, looking at um, ways to help, you know, um, individuals um, learn how to keep their homes safe. 
So we have um, a slew of webinars, you know, started last week, Friday, um, going all the way to June 29th. Um, and, you know, we're having some of our sessions in English, Spanish, um, Chinese, um, in Bengali, and Russian. So if you know of individuals, it'd be great to join us. And we also invited our um, one of our city agency, New York City Department of Buildings, to talk about their community engagement. Um, what is it that they do? Um, how they get the, you know, connect with the community and what are the things that they're responsible for. And we also have our Poison Control Center talking about summer safety, which is really good um, to prepare um, your residents about summer safety. So as you can see, the slew of webinars that we have and one of the things we ask is if you can take the schedule and just share it out to the community and you know, improve those numbers as you can see what's happening in our, our area. Okay. And then just to let you know, if you haven't known already, that many of you are um, know about the health department and the health department has a speaker um, health fair request. I'm not sure if you do know this, but they do. Um, so this is the QR code. Um, if, if you give me a few uh, minutes, I can actually walk you through it. And what happens- We may not. We may not have a few minutes, just, uh, okay. so, just this is, so this is the QR code. If you wish to request, like if you're having any tabling event or you want a presentation, you can go to that page, complete it, and then someone from the health department will connect with you um, about any um, events. It also lists all the different areas um, in the health department that can provide services as far as, you know, any health fairs or any lectures or et cetera. So this is the QR code that um, you can use and you can, you know, to be connected and to get someone from the health department to participate in some of your events that you're having. We also have a community resource database. That's the database that I, I received the information earlier that you can also get. Um, it has about 250 indicators. Um, you can put in the information about the neighborhood and see what's happening as far as environmental health. To visit the site, that's the, the link to visit the site and you can go on there. You can also, there is a uh, email there that you can actually ask them questions about the site if you're interested or even if you're interested in having someone from that area to be at your meeting to discuss how to use the portal, okay? And lastly, these are our team. These are team members to our outreach team, um, education unit. And um, if you haven't already to follow the health department, this is their social media handle. Um, to just to let you know that it's available and it's great if you haven't um, connected us yet. And thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Uh, uh, Charlene, this has been tremendous, uh, tremendously helpful. And there are a number of groups, I'm sure they were taking notes and we'll be in contact with you. Uh, I know that um, our committee will because of all the presentations we need to hear as well. So I'll be contacting you about speakers. Are there any other questions that any of you well, would have? Hi, Laquita, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Ms. Gordon, for you know the information and all the resources that you share. Um, when it comes to asthma in our community, uh, you you show some of the you know um, you know environmental factors that impact uh, the worsening numbers that we have. However, I I I didn't see how the pollution from vehicles in our community is also contributing to that. It is known that the nitric oxide, that you know, diesel fuel, trucks they spew, it worsens, uh, you know, respiratory illnesses such as asthma. In our community, we have um, issues because we have many trucks. If you go around Community Board Nine after nine o'clock at night, you will see many trucks just park around. Um, and I, you know, this is something that we have discussed before, uh, because you know the community is cleaning this. So, you know, it is important for the Department of Health to also look at that data because yes, we look at the home, but if you have a truck right outside your apartment, 
that is spewing these fumes and you're breathing it is making your health worse. So is there any data that you guys have on this? And if not, this is something to bring back so you guys can collect because, um, you know, this is uh, something that we can, uh, you know, pay attention to, to address because not only the home, but also uh, the environment where we are outside matters. It's next to our parks, our schools, and everything. Yes, that's a, it's a good point. Um, I would actually direct that um, concern over to my colleagues in the, um, the Harlem um, Neighborhood um, Health Center because they do have an asthma um, focus in their area. Um, my, um, the reason why I shared with you that area is because some of those in, environmental hazards. So our focus as far as education is more indoor. Yeah. Right. And, and, and that's what they can control. However, right. you know, having these trucks outside, you know, that, you know, that's not trucks that are operating during business hours. These are trucks that are staying there overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, these folks, they have no control over that. Yeah. Um, and this is an environmental pollution that directly impacts the health of the residents of our community. Right. Yeah. Maybe um, someone from maybe WIAC um, probably can respond to that. Um, because I do know that they've, you know, done um, some work with outdoor pollution. We have um, a resolution, Community Board 9 resolution on this matter. And uh, it has led us to having DEP and uh, there's one other agency uh, that we're hoping will hone NYPD. on this. NYPD. NYPD. They have responded, but... Um, I think even they know that their responses have not been adequate. So uh, they have uh, provided some feedback and uh, moving into action based on some, um, what do you call it? Uh, they've had, they've gotten some, um, not tickets or, but notices uh, that they've left in some areas but um, hopefully we can get a stronger response by, uh, was it mid-June? There's some uh, possibly even uh, court issue. So unless I'm getting that one mixed up with the auto body shop, but uh, we have- well, Makuta, Makuta, you're right. Um, the data that Ms. Gordon show basically accentuate why we passed a resolution and the importance of you know having a multi-agency approach because DEP has a law that trucks cannot park overnight. Um, the Department of Health is focusing in the indoor aspect, but folks cannot control what's happening outside. That requires the enforcement of the existing law. But for Ms. Gordon, I would say that that is a variable that the Department of Health can pay attention to. Because if you go to the Upper East Side, I will you know, tell you, take it, you know, walk around and see how many trucks you see parked there overnight. They'll get ticket toll right away. In CB9, that doesn't happen. Yet, this is leading us to many health, you know, disparities that we get to see, such as the one you presented. And so we've uh, been on top of this topic, especially Dr. Torres, is he's been absolutely relentless on it and we appreciate that but we need more community people and more um agency representatives to to kind of hone in on this too supposedly um new york city hall convened a task force so um on to address overnight truck parking in new york city uh we've been trying to find someone from the task force to speak to our group and maybe that's one thing uh, at DOH you can assist us with. At least letting us know who we can reach out to. But there was a task force, uh, this was reported on March 6th, uh, just on to address overnight truck parking in New York City. 
So that's not to put you totally on the spot, but if that's something you can help us with uh, and identify who can give us a follow-up as well, that would be great. So is Miss um, um, Carmen, Carmita, are you on? I am. Is something that um, someone from the asthma center can assist with? No, we don't have that data for uh, either. We need to get it from uh, the environmental groups. And we've been, uh, um, I think the, uh, when you remind me of the, um, of um, Kenneth and his department, um, external affairs, like we reached out to him to help us connect who might be able to uh, get, uh, gather more information for, for us. And uh, the task force that was set up, yeah, th thank you, Ms. Padilla. It will be, you know, important to put it together because this will help us yep. get the other piece of the puzzle. Yep. Um, the home and also the outside environment. Yeah. So we can understand better this phenomenon of having folks in Harlem with higher rate of asthma than the rest of the city. Uh, agree with you definitely, and we'll again we'll uh, we'll do our best to see any connection. We we ask around too, which the. Department of, um, you know, which division of the, of the Department of Health might have that information and then make that connection for you. Um, so we'll also, you know, uh, continue to reach out to our contacts and see if we have more information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question or comment? Charlie, thank you so much for uh, visiting with us and we look forward to seeing you again and any with any updates as well okay all righty thank you so much and that what uh miss gordon just talked about uh sort of uh segues into uh our next uh the introduction of the bioscience junior scientist uh summer internship program which was introduced to us by a couple of our uh, board colleagues, uh, Deirdre McIntosh Brown uh, particular, in particular. So uh, with the information she forwarded to us, we've invited uh, Dr. Christine Maritzi, and I believe she's, um, I saw her name earlier, hopefully she's still with us, to talk about uh, the Junior Scientist Summer Internship Program. And if, um, Lewis Bailey, who represents We Act and is part of the Community Board 9 family, would chime in as well uh, in terms of how you interact with the biobiz.org. Um, Christine Maritzi, Dr. Maritzi, is the director of the Community Science Program in Harlem. Welcome, Dr. Maritzi. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? Actually, thank you so much. The perfect pronunciation. Uh, I'm not American. Everyone says, yeah, Mrs. Maurice. And I'm like, ah, it's actually Maritzi. It is, it's perfect. You know, it really, really, <laughs> it really hits home. <laughs> for me. Thank you so okay. much for giving me like the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I, I really appreciate the, the time. And um, again, that we can come. I, I come with two little requests and also thank you, know, uh, Mrs. Brown again, just like for making the introduction. I, I usually go to the youth and education and library meetings, but it's like a pleasure to be here today. And I have prepared um, some slides. I'm very mindful about time, I know, but I think it's going to be easier to like, you know, to make my... Okay, my let me uh, make you a co-host. I appreciate it, yeah. Um, you are now a co-host. Thank you. I'm going to get my screen sharing going on. I know we are remote and online technology services years, but there's still like this little moment. Can you see my slides? Um, yeah. Yes. So um, yes, I, I do represent, um, it's a team of scientists that actually, like, you know, are driving around the bus in New York City and it's called the Bio Bus. if you have never heard of us before. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Our vision is actually all people achieve their full scientific potential, meaning that um, we, we really help to, since more than a decade, to help K-12 and college students in New York City to discover, explore, and pursue science. And particularly, we also have community spaces. One of them is in, actually in Harlem that I oversee with the caption zone of East West Harlem, Washington Heights, and a little bit of the South Bronx. And we, we focus on students 
that are excluded or have been historically excluded from the scientific community due to factors such as race, gender, economic status, and physical access. That's not all, you know, exclusion factors historically, but that's what, you know, I, I just want to mention today. Um, our Biobase Harlem, this is the community space um, we share together with Columbia University. So we are our own independent nonprofit organization, but we share space together with Columbia University. You see one of our buses parked in front of the Gerald Green Science Center, which is like 129th Street and Broadway. And this the space right behind the bus is actually our community space, um, which is very flexible. And we have free after school programs happening for families or school children that just want to get their extra taste of science outside of school. But we also bring, of course, programs to the students and to the families. And, um, and we have an internship program that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about. The reason why we do it is, is because um, it's very important um, to if you have a youth that might not know that it's this very inquisitive mind, and you know, we all know those youth in our life, right? But these youth might not actually get touch points with like, you know, scientific careers or like, you know, touch points with like, you know, ways to explore this desire to learn more about science or the world, um, they're missing out, right? And we, we bring the bus out to hundreds of students every single year. We make them hungry, invite them to come back to after school programs or summer camps at the bio base, which is called Explore. And then a portion of those students, as soon as they're in high school, they actually um, are entering a mentored research experience called an internship. And that's also paid, which is very important. It's like a real job. You can learn about your environment. You can like hone all those critical thinking skills or other skills, whatever you want to do, formulate your own research question. You actually get paid to do this. It's just like a really, really fantastic opportunity for youth. Um, this just shows where you all have been. This is like a map of New York City. We have been all over the place, serving more than 250,000 students since 2008. And again, honing in, this is the caption zone. The Harlem Biobase is right here. And it shows like, you know, all the yellow dots are high school students that just undergo our internship and they are coming like, you know, a lot from Harlem, but also from the South Bronx, Northern Manhattan. And a lot of those Explore students actually are coming from the area right here as well. So um, we really, really work hard to serve the community. It's, I have the feeling when you do this work, it's never enough. I always want to have more students. I always want to have more staff at buy us to even serve more people. Uh, but of course, there's limitations. Um, I just like, you know, want to leave this quote here, um, the impact that we have on the youth and we really, really try to recruit them from the area um, that they are like, you know, feeling we, we learn together as a community. We really see like, you know, students entering our path, like our pathway as, as, as humans, right? That just need access and support to just like literally hone their skills and we are here to support them. We are the platform because they have lived knowledge and they can bring so much on the table and we appreciate them. So it really, really is wonderful to hear those quotes. And uh, if you're wondering, uh, so what do students, after they actually do an internship here at Biobus, a lot of them actually chose to go into science or science-related careers. And 94% of students are just like, um, we completed the survey recently, they actually like are like majoring and minoring in science, which is like really, really remarkable, especially if you want to try to move the needle and like, you know, make science also more diverse and bring different perspectives on the table. And even, I even go so far, it's not enough to have a voice in the table. We can build our own table. You know, there's so much talent. We can build our own table and just like, you know, really convert the conversation. So what I'm here today is we have 20 bright high school students, the majority from this neighborhood, um, joining um, into a mentored research experience July 5th. And our signature is they all develop their own research question. It's usually place-based. It needs to have something to do with the environment. It's also student-driven, and it's a top about a topic they care about. And what we want to try differently this year is we hope to conduct a walking tour of Harlem, again, the area where they're going to be doing their research and placing the research question about. And we would like to help them identify areas of environmental concern to incorporate into their own projects. Um, we all know youth is very concerned about environmental justice, gentrification, pollution. And this is why I'm here, because I'm asking, I'm wondering if, you know, this board could help us to arrange a time on Monday, 7.10, or it could also be 7.6, 
to stop by and speak to some representative or even maybe one representative to talk about the initiatives that you already have happening in this community to inform those students or about any other environmental justice issues that you know you are concerned as a community because there might be a way that again those youth can be inspired by your initiatives or questions or they can be part of a solution again they're going to be with us for six weeks they will do research um, a lot about is about urban ecology ecology but also environmental justice and we would really love for them to um, again speak to community members that would like give them like the youth a little bit of guidance or like you know just tell them a little bit what's happening in the neighborhood because I'm I'm pretty sure although they actually have <clears throat> a lot like although they live in the community some of them might not know about the richness of the community mm -hmm. and you know what's actually at their doorsteps and I just like see us as a conduit between like you know you and us so this is my first question I would love to hear like you know from the community about this and my second question is and well, you know, I've been sitting in this meeting. I was about, I got so excited because you, yes, we talk about like, you know, how can we prepare about the next pandemic? If we talk about recruitment, we do have another open internship that's recruiting at the moment. Just going to use sorry, the faces of these five junior scientists that just like, you know, finished the cycle with us. Uh, it's the New York City Virus Hunters Community Science Initiative that actually, like, you know, keeps an eye on diseases in wild urban birds and especially bird flu, because that's right now ripping through the wild bird population with devastating effects. And um, we are a collaboration again between Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, they have virologists to help us out to give youth lab space, junior scientists, and then we also work with the Wild Bird Fund and the Animal Care Center in New York City, like one of them, the Harlem location, to like make this research happening. And this is important because, um, again, it's mentored research, but we are the only in the, or the first initiative worldwide that actually looks at the wild urban bird population and what kind of like an viruses might be circulating there because sometimes the virus can jump from an animal into a different animal or even into human um, population, mm -hmm. right? You know, this is how an, a pandemic happens and we want to make sure we're going to prevent the next pandemic. Um, last year, we have been sampling 14,000 samples we did find six different novel viruses, you know, that are now published together with the students in the byline. Again, these are high school students, and I see myself like as a platform to help this research happening. And this is one of the publications that came out last year. We found a virus in pigeons, first time described in New York City. Uh, of course, you have to report this to the USDA and the New York City Health Department. It's not dangerous for humans, but it's just like, you know, devastating. If you are a chicken, you are very afraid of this. Um, but again, it's it's really remarkable to have like, you know, the community supports you do this kind of research. And so my second ask here is, yes, this, this Virus Hunters program is currently looking for high school students that want to learn at this intersection of veterinary medicine, virology, microbiology, or maybe even also bioinformatics. I have a free, and I repeat, it's a free hands-on 25-hour prep course at the Harlem Biobase. That I'm, I'm leading this course with my team. If you have any high school student that is in grade nine to 11 and would like to take this opportunity, um, then you know, um, please feel free to get in touch and check out our website. It's virus hunters or biobus.org in general. And that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for your time. And I'm very, very excited to hear from you how we can like, you know, work together and, and bring you like, you know, youth closer to the environmental justice initiatives happening in the city. And, and um, sorry, um, environment. I, I'm so excited right now. You, I think you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and I see your hands up. Yeah. Thank you. I am <laughs> you. so oh, glad wow. that we we learned of you. I'm sure there are a couple of hands. I, I think I heard oh. Malik and of course, yes. uh, Dr. Torres. So uh, let me just see what you go for first, uh, Monique, and then Dr. Torres, and I'll just check to see who else's hands are up. Yeah, I'm equally excited for you, Dr. Maritzi. I'm a science nerd myself. And so listening to you and looking at those beautiful young ladies in those photos doing this, the very same things I used to do as a inquisitive uh, person of science. Um, I'm, I'm so excited about the program. I'm glad Deirdre brought it uh, to our attention and I'm looking forward to see how we can partner with you. 
I'm sitting here listening and thinking about some of the things our committees are working on. Uh, we're always talking and trying to work collaboratively. One of the things that came to mind, and this is free floating in terms of thought, is um, the uh, Marine Transfer Station that's in our community. That station is languishing and nothing is happening as of yet. We've had discussions about it and we're looking to see what we can do there um, to support our community. Uh, there seems like there's so much potential there and I'm sure young people who are so bright, creative and just not inhibited probably could think of even other things that we haven't even begun to think of in terms of opportunities there. So that is the first thing I thought about. And, you know, I don't know how we, you know, we can move from my comments to doing something there, but that was my thought. So I just wanted to share and, and thank you so much for bringing this wonderful resource to our attention. Thanks, Monique. And then after Dr. Torres, uh, I had asked Lewis Bailey to weigh in. So uh, his coming out to do Dr. Torres could be really good because I think yeah. Lewis has some uh, suggestions there. Uh, Dr. Torres? Yeah, thank you for, for this wonderful program. I was going to suggest, uh, Ms. Marisi, that um, perhaps we can have some of your flyers and we can get you in touch with some of the local nonprofits that we have in the community. I'm thinking of Palante Harlem. They deal with housing and folks who are in housing distress. A lot of times the parents, they are you know, overly stressed with their housing situation. And they, they have kids who are very curious and want to be engaged, but the parents, they're so stressed just trying to keep a roof over their head. And to find out about a program like this, it can be very helpful to let that pressure from those kids who are living under that stressful environment to sort of, you know, nurture that um, inquisitive mind that they have and perhaps be the, ne the next scientist that we need in, in our community. That's a great idea. Uh, and also maybe even Manhattanville, some of the, uh, one of our board members lives there, may know some high school students interested. Yeah. And, um, uh, I was thinking about even the Osborne Associates, they work with uh, young people uh, that may be some, there may be a high school student among them or the children of some who would be interested in that high school program. So yeah, I like Palante Harlem, uh, Manhattanville, where we have some direct contacts and Osborne. Uh, anything else Dr. Torres that you wanted to? And no, thank you, Laquita. I think that, you know, what you said is, 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 is supplements uh, what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. And Lewis Bailey, I <laughs> wanted you to chime in. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, before, Good Lewis, evening. Lewis, before you speak, Patricia um, Ramos, shared brotherhood, oh. sister soul. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Right, right. Well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that was seen. That was it. No, I hadn't seen it yet. No, it's in the chat. I'm um the creator. Okay. Thanks, Monique. Go ahead, Lewis. Sorry. Lewis. No Lewis problem. Is our we Dr. Maisi, thank you so much. My name is Bailey. I'm the manager of membership and organizing at WEAC. So as someone mentioned, uh uh Monique Harden Cordero mentioned about the Marine Transfer Station, CB9, other entities in the community worked on along with WEAC. Um to uh, decide what we were going to do. This was years ago about that Marine Transfer Station. As you know, besides the Marine Transfer Station, we have the sewage treatment plant. We have five bus depots. We had a lot of stuff within the community and I grew up here. So I understand um, the need for this. So um, my idea is um, I'll talk to Laquita and I gave you my email. We can discuss either myself or somebody from WEAC to come on whether it's July, was he, I think you said July 10th, yes, six to, or come, 10th. Uh -huh. to come and, and speak, you know, to the students and give them a wide range of, you know, Northern Manhattan is big. It's 600,000 residents in Northern Manhattan alone. We know, we, I know we're focused night on um, West Harlem, but there's a lot of stuff 
within the community that we can give and shed some light on. So I gave you my email. I'm looking forward to it. And um, Patricia beat me to it. But yeah, I was going to suggest Brotherhood Sister Soul because they work focused solely on youth. They don't do anything else but youth. You know, they have composting. That's their, their primary objective. Basically, we act does not have a youth component. You know, we work with the community, but we don't work specifically with youth. But I'd be interested to come in and, and speak into the group about some potential ideas. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. We, we are even willing to come to you. So we would even be willing to come like walk to your side again it's a walking tour we're mobile it's also like an all about lift experience right you know we all bring so much so much knowledge already to the table so why not rabbit shot I, I really really appreciate that yeah thank you i will be in touch on the address You're welcome. well though there are those are three organizations right here we act is superb and uh as well as with their location brotherhood sister soul um they would also be a great stop on that walking tour um and as well as I know, we'll get the name of the person, uh, their director, executive director to you. Uh, and also, Palant does Palante have a, um, well, I think they have a walk-in location also, right, uh, Edwin? Yes, and they have a summer youth program also. Yeah, that would be so great. Marisi, I wanted to say one other thing is, we at Conducts, um, or via bus, of course. I know this is a walking tour, but for years we've done a tour of Northern Manhattan and even into the Bronx with our, you know, with our members to show them some of the things that are in the community that people may not even know. You know, right by the uh, West Harlem Pierce Park, there's a gas line that's right there on the waterfront that people probably walk past and don't even notice there's a gas line right there. So like these, these things are in the community and we'd be more than welcome to uh, assist you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. So that's at least three or four organizations that we could put you in touch with. And uh, some of them may have, uh, let's see, am I? Okay, whoops. Did I, are we, am I still? Oh, there we are. Okay. You're still here. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions, suggestions? Um, oh, sorry, question, um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Maritzi. So your program starts July 5th and how long does it run till? So the um, the, um, the students um, will be with us um, July 5th until mid-August, um, but we would like to get the walking tour, learning about the community early and while they actually develop the research question and then they can right. do the remainder of, of the five weeks with us to just like come up with a meaningful solution. Again, we're happy to, I remember, happy to come back and bring the students back and then report out. You oh, know, that what, would be oh. great. Yes, because that great. was the co-empowerment. I was yes. the most excited I, I, about. Right? I got excited by that. Yeah. That's one yeah. of the favorite things I would do with students. Yeah. Have them formulate their their question and then share their research at the end. If there is an opportunity to hear them, yeah. I would be thrilled to be present. If given notice, I'll make time in my schedule. Thank That's you so much. Yeah, definitely. My day. I and, second that. <laughs> and I will send out like all the other flyers about the July 3rd opportunity about like, again, virology and vi environmental justice, um, the free course, I will send you the flyers. Uh, I would love to have more students from the neighborhood involved. It's a really unique opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And so we'll also, everyone we keep Deidre. in mind recommending uh, trying to find high school students that could participate uh, with the paid intern summer internship. Yeah, Deidre. Yeah, hi. I just wanted to say um, I'm sorry I'm out and walking about, but I just wanted to say thank you to um, chairs um, Torres and uh, Henry, as well as Christina and the Bio Bus, to tell you that um, yeah, wonderful. We we support you, but I also have the information for the Brosis for Gabe and um, for um, Nando Rodriguez, and I will make sure that you have that Christine tomorrow and connect you. And just to repeat, oh, just to repeat, the person on screen now, Deirdre McIntosh Brown, is the person who introduced our committee to uh, this junior scientist program and Dr. Maritzi. And I want to give uh, acknowledgement also to Ms. Maya Yashidi, who 
uh, was on that thread of seeking uh, Community Board 9's uh, involvement. There's another hand up, or is that a legacy hand? Um, let's see. Maybe that was the legacy hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. This was this is all very exciting. Was there anything else, Deirdre, that you wanted to add uh, that we should know about in our committee? No, just letting you know that Chris we've been partnering with the BioBus and gone through the program with Christine over the summer. So it's it's an awesome program. And so, yep. Okay, thank you. Anything uh, that you want to conclude with, Dr. Moretzi? No, I'm I'm overwhelmed by support, and again, passes on to the youth. And thank you so much. It's 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 an honor. Thank you. Okay. Um, so moving right along, we only have two, uh, a couple of other things. Um, we have uh, Wendy Millette with the Tall Mega Charitable Trust who has a follow-up. She, her organization is one of the West Harlem Development Corporation's um, corporation funded programs. And they presented to us um, earlier in 2022, oh no, December, 2022. And so she's back and with a brief presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, do, do you need? Um, yes, I do. I'd like to share. I do have a presentation. Okay. Let me make you a co-host, Wendy. Let's see here. Where's your name? Here you are. Okay. Okay, so you are now a co-host. Thank you. Um, as usual, I could never cut. Okay, so um, um, okay, ready, Wendy? Um, I can never sh share. I want to share. While Wendy is doing that, we just have one other. Um, important topic when she completes and that is our uh draft resolution uh for um 1727 amsterdam avenue it was emailed to the committee not that long ago when edwin and i worked together to complete what we would uh do in uh, what we would recommend and we would want our committees uh approval or any addition. So if you just hang on, uh, that will be the only thing after Ms. Millette's presentation. Okay, Wendy, okay. making it through. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm the chairperson of the Tom Mega Charitable Trust Fund, the Board of Trustees, and we're a nonprofit organization that was started by Tom Mega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority in 1968. Um, I did come before you before, acknowledging the receipt of a receipt of a grant from the West Harlem Development Corporation. And I, I thank the co-chairman, uh, Laquita Henry, Henry and Edwin Torres for allowing us to return tonight to provide an update. And I do have um, many of our board members here with me tonight. Welcome. Thank okay. you. <laughs> So tonight we'll share with you what we've done over the last eight months to implement the program. So as previously mentioned, we want to inform young people how to recognize mental health disorders that may stymie their efforts to pursue and achieve their educational endeavors. A team of mental health professionals worked diligently to provide the resource material regarding the signs, symptoms, and treatment options related to the mental health disorders most likely to affect young people, anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation, and stress. Their work formed the foundation of everything else that we've created targeted towards young people. So since we'd be sharing information in multiple formats over a period of time, we had brand guidelines developed to ensure that the Making It Through program becomes a recognized brand among our target audiences. 
So you see the colors, our logo, and the font. So some of the here are some of the examples of how the material that we've created consistently followed our brand guidelines. The logo in the middle at the bottom, a mock-up of our website, a tip sheet on mat time management and contact information for available with available resources, the sign-in sheet to keep track of who we're interacting with, and thumbnail depictions of the mental health disorders that we are focusing on that I mentioned previously. In an attempt to reach our target audience, where the, we reach them where they are, we establish social media accounts on the most popular mediums, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where we will post various types of information. We use multiple email accounts to facilitate interactive communication. And we have a YouTube channel to distribute and store the videos that were created. And our internet president, presence is a secure website. All channels prominently include in its name, making it through to reinforce program identification. So this was our first um, post that we put out on social media. Even though I just talked about brand guidelines, these may be a little different because this was the draft that I had available to share, but it was telling the public the why, the how, and the where of our program. And tonight I'd like to premiere, I'm pleased to premiere the video that was created related to depression. Making it through, unlocking the best you. It's okay not to be okay. For college students, especially students of color and women, the demands of college life can be overwhelming. Studies show that added stress of racism, financial woes, microaggression, the pandemic, and the pressure to overachieve create anxiety, stress, sleep deprivation, and depression. Take charge of your mental health. Identify the problem. Utilize coping tools and get the appropriate therapy. Depression, what is it? It is a common a serious mood disorder. Depression affects you, how you feel, think, and handle day-to-day -day activities such as sleeping, eating, or working. The main risk factors for depression are family history, poverty, unemployment, drug and alcohol use, and stressful life events like losing a scholarship. A broken relationship is another common life event that can just start your blues. Did we lose the sound? No, it, there's text on the screen. Oh, okay. Some of the symptoms of depression are persistent sadness throughout the day, a sensation of helplessness, thoughts of self-harm, being irritable and grumpy. Be watchful for physical symptoms like being unmotivated to do anything, unexplained aches and pains that don't have a source, sluggishness, losing or gaining weight rapidly, there are ways to fight the fun. Look to psychotherapy with a trained professional who can prescribe medication if needed. And of course, a little bit of acknowledgement and access can be helpful. Here are some things that can be done. Exercise. Go for a 20-minute walk. Get out and stretch. Socialize. Call a friend and reach out to family. And eat healthy. And if you still feel like you can't cope, don't be ashamed to seek out a mental health professional. It is the key to unlocking the best you. So 
So there are two additional videos covering anxiety and sleep deprivation. Initially, they will all be debuted via social media and then available on our website channel. Additionally, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network with a reach of over 400,000 cable subscribers in the borough will share our videos at PSA. Oh. It's excellent. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I interrupted so, saying it was so excellent. So our outreach, <laughs> outreach to our target population included three social media posts during the month of May, participating in the Hope Center, Hope in Harlem Conference Street Fair on May 13th, promoting the program during the NAMI Walk on May 20th, and conducting two workshops for high school seniors at Frederick Douglass Academy on May 24th. Our next steps, we'll continue program implementation by publicizing our mental health fair scheduled for June 10th to schools and organizations in Community Board 9 and tabling at West Harlem Development Corporation's Youth Resource Fair on June 14th. There's a calendar to distribute the information via email and on social media with posts and links to the videos that we created. In addition, to encourage participation, we will start a TikTok challenge related to our mental health disorder focus and awareness of resources. So it's our hope that we can continue the program and expand the types of services that we provide. We appreciate your support and hope that we have the opportunity to present our program to you again. Thank you for this time on your agenda. And at this time, I will answer any questions. Thank that you. That was superb, Wendy. Uh, congratulations to you and your team in putting that together. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, uh, any comments, hands? Let's see. Oh, there's oh, there's a thumbs up from uh, Dr. Marisi there. Thank you. Um, Let's see. Yes. Are there any other comments? Uh, seems like I heard I, someone. I have a question, I guess. A comment and a question. Okay, Monique. I know I'm very verbal this evening. No, no, that's okay. Go ahead. The video, uh, Wendy, was fabulous. Thank you. It's nice to see young people being engaged and messaging. Um, I, I assume the uh, video has been out. Uh, have you been able to... Um, see reaction to it like the impact of the video being shown we have not oh not yet not so we're, yet. it's being debut a debut with debut, you were the first to see them oh sorry and i, I would like to acknowledge <laughs> our product our producer okay singleton who is on the call with us tonight oh she say said. that name again wendy kim singleton okay Okay. And she's affiliated with the Neighborhood I, Network, I, I, as well as a um, podcast, Considering It Black Lit. So. Is there a survey that you might have uh, each time you show it to get a reaction? Um, you know, short, yeah. like four question or four point, uh, you know, short yes and no kind of survey to get a reaction to yes. uh, get feedback. Yes, we will do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was curious about, just to know the impact so that we can know what things resonate in our community. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we will do that. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing us to present. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And so... Um, when you come back, well, maybe in September, uh, you'll have more information. I'm not sure what you're doing over the summer, if, uh, but that may allow some time for some feedback since you'll be going to showcasing it other places. Okay, I'll make a note of it. I made a note of it. Thank you. West Harlem Development Corporation, money well spent. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and an organization well-funded. Okay. Um, Let's see if there's anything else uh, uh, in the chat. There are other uh, comment commendations on the, the video as well. 
Thank you very much again. Um, and Wendy, be in touch. Um, before, just one other thing. I see, I think Odette Wilkins uh, is among us. And Odette, if you could just take 60 seconds on that uh, link 5G. We did talk about it earlier. I didn't realize that you were in the audience um, among us until a little bit later. Uh, when, yeah, there she is. Odette or Julie Marden uh, with the presentation coming up or something going on tomorrow. Can you just make a short, a brief comment? Either of you? I don't know, maybe they stepped away. Uh, Odette Wilkins. She's on, but maybe she stepped, had to step away. Julie Martin. Okay, maybe we can just come back, come back to them. Um, so moving forward. Um, I think someone has their hand up, Sue. Was that? Yes, is it possible to speak? Oh, link 5G? Yes. Okay, just very briefly, we had mentioned it much earlier and I had sent out the flyers, but I didn't, I noticed uh, Julie and Odette um, very late as we were moving along. So yes, Sue, just make it very brief, if you will. Yes. I know you have something coming up tomorrow. Yes, I work with Odette and Julie, and we really want to encourage people to come this Wednesday at 1 p.m., at City Hall, the Committee of Technology of the City Council, and they will be taking live testimony. You can also, I'll put it in the chat, you can also sign up to speak through Zoom, one or the other. But we really are encouraging to get as many voices as possible to expose all of the issues and for me, it's especially the health issues around this technology that is not being shared with us by our city government. It's incredible. Thank you very much. Did the meeting occur with the mayor's representative, uh, was it last week or a week and a half ago? Because I know there was a change in the date and then the mayor couldn't come, uh, but they he was gonna send a representative. Did that meeting take place? Yes, I didn't attend it, Odette did. It wasn't with the mayor. He backed out at the, you know, and he said, uh, you can meet, I believe with OTI, which is his Office of Technology. And my understanding from Odette was that the meeting was uh, not very uh, helpful at all. Ah. But you should speak to Odette. Okay, because we should have some follow up on that. And then uh, I believe that we, I know that I sent out the flyer for this uh, Wednesday's technology session with the city council. It was also put in our chat earlier this evening. So Great. if everyone would make sure that they look back uh, and it is something we need to keep up with. And we did do a resolution um, you know, not approving some 5G development around. And, La and Laquita, Laquita, did you also send out to your board next week the uh, Silicon um, Harlem meeting? Did you get that? Um, I got two flyers, but if you resend it, then I will definitely um, send it to our district office and see if they would send it out to our members. I will do that because that's another opportunity for people to speak out against this horrendous technology. I will do that. Thank okay. you, Sue. I'm glad you spoke up. Let Odette and uh, Julie know that I did call on them. Okay, great. Okay, thanks again. Is that a legacy hand? Uh, oh, that's Sue's hand. Okay. Uh, now in reference to our resolution um just one second let me make sure we pull it up uh it was emailed to everyone uh i'm not sure if uh let's see 
Do you have it, Luquita? Uh, yes, but it doesn't hurt to show it on the screen. Can you uh, um, see, Monique? Let me make you co host again. Okay. Um, and it's the one that we call resolution September, uh, 1727 right. Amsterdam Avenue. It is okay. our draft. And let me say that um, it will be uh, pulled together in partnership with housing and land, our housing land use uh, and zoning committee. So, you know, we're working together. Obviously there is a health component because of uh, the three and sometimes four agencies that are in the facility. So we wanted to weigh in as well. Uh, we need um, and wanted to present this to our committee first. And then uh, once we approve, we'll pass it on to uh, Signe and Liz uh, for the housing land use, which may be meeting, I'm not sure if they meet tomorrow or Wednesday, because I hope to be in uh, uh, their meeting as well. And then- uh, Next Tuesday, Laquita, a week from tomorrow. Uh, hi, Barry. I did see, hi, Barry. Thank you for joining joining us with this. So I'll, I'll just go through it very okay. quickly. Please um, make no committee and see where you would add or change something. This is a draft, so we may change wording here and there. But right. I have it okay. up, Laquita. All right. So whereas our community values the preservation of landmarks and the importance of maintaining the character of our neighborhood, whereas the redevelopment of the block at 1727 Amsterdam presents an opportunity to create a beacon of architectural excellence and cultural significance. Whereas it is essential to prioritize the inclusion of fine renderings that showcase the building as a jewel on the hill, reflecting its historic and cultural sig signature rather than a generic design. Whereas the consideration of lighting, plaza design and visible artwork should be culturally and historically appropriate adding to the overall aesthetic and appeal of the community. Whereas our community is committed to ensuring a healthy environment and managing air quality concerns. Whereas conducting comprehensive environmental assessment and seeking input from the established community is crucial to address potential air toxicity and mitigate any adverse effects Whereas our community recognizes the need to balance population growth with the availability of essential services. Whereas it is important to provide housing for our current and longstanding residents. Whereas our community is deeply appreciative of the medical and clinic facilities such as the Emma Bowen Community Center, the Jackson Center of Ophthalmology, Heritage Health and Housing Inc and occasional New York City Health and Hospitals services, which have been instrumental in eradicating health disparities and providing health quality care. Whereas the facilities mentioned above have demonstrated proficiency, stability, patient preference, and an array of expertise and resources contributing significantly to the well being of our community. Whereas concerns have been raised about the lack of transparency and community involvement in the decision-making process for the redevelopment of 1727 Amsterdam. And there is a strong desire to reevaluate the current plan and engage in meaningful public discussion. Therefore, be it resolved that we propose a refined blueprint for the redevelopment of 1727 Amsterdam that includes the same square footage required to accommodate the existing and necessary community services, be it further resolved that the refined blueprint ensures adequate space, staffing and equipment for the facilities mentioned earlier, enabling them to continue their essential functions and serve the community effectively, be it resolved further that the community actively participates in the refinement process providing input on design elements, cultural appropriateness, and the integration of artwork that reflects the history 
and heritage of our neighborhood. Be it further resolved that comprehensive environmental assessments be conducted and their findings be shared with the community allowing for collaborative efforts to mitigate any potential air toxicity concerns. Be it further resolved that efforts be made to balance population growth with the availability of services, ensuring that the redevelopment of 1727 Amsterdam contributes to a sustainable population to services ratio. Be it further resolved that future decision-making processes regarding the redevelopment of community landmarks and facilities prioritize transparency, public engagement, and the inclusion of town hall meetings to gather input and address community concerns. We, the undersigned members of the community, propose and support this resolution in order to preserve our community's heritage, ensure the provision of essential services, and foster a collaborative and inclusive process for the redevelopment of 1727 Amsterdam. Um, so that said, um, you know, I drafted it when refined and, you know, we wanted you guys to see it and see what additions you would put in. But again, it's not, it's just something that we would recommend from our committee and then have it go to health, uh, um, housing, land use, and see what we can come up with uh, to present. Barry, is there something that uh, you can add to uh, based uh, on what you just heard and along with our committee? I mean, I would, um, I would just, you know, be a little stronger on the fact that our neighborhood, like most of the country, needs more community-based mental health care, not less. And mm -hmm. so the fact that they're reducing the square footage of the mental health center is not a good thing. Hmm. Point well taken. Let me just, okay. Any other reactions and... As you all know, this is our draft that will go to housing land use and we can, uh, you know, in overnight, uh, let's see, when, uh, Barry, say again, when is the committee meeting? Is, is it when's, when is the, the meeting? The meeting meets a week from tomorrow. Oh, a week from tomorrow. The okay. second Thursday of the month. So we're gonna have a draft of our resolution by Thursday for exec, and we can incorporate a lot of what's in here. Okay. So we'll try to, uh, well, tonight, and of course, everyone on the committee has it. If there's something you want to email uh, as a change based on what you see, please let us know so we can input that and then have it for, um, you know, so we can just get it out tomorrow and then it could be incorporated. Uh, let's see that. Well, and I'm executive, sure executive housing. Yeah, I'm sure housing will include something about the need for more family housing units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would think so. And I think we would Because that agreement. also speaks to the health of the community when you take up the family into consideration. Exactly, the mental health, yes feeling secure. Any other comments or feedback? Let's see. Edwin, did you, I know he had to step away for a while. Um, it looks like you put something in the chat. I don't know if this is, I guess I'm tweaking to the language. Let's see here. But I think it's excellent. I think it's very good. Yeah, I do too especially involvement of the community in terms of what the next steps will be. I think we have to, we can't stress that enough. <laughs> okay, and then uh, here's uh, some things he wrote as adding to mental health, he wrote, whereas these facilities have also played a critical role in supporting mental health services within our community, whereas the availability and accessibility of mental health support are paramount to the well-being of our community, whereas our community cannot afford to have mental health services cut or compromised in any way. Yeah, that's pretty 
much that sounds to pretty the strong. point. Yeah. Okay, so we'll add that to to what's here. Okay. Any other feedback? Uh, hi, is this on 1727? Yes, on 1727. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, the sort of continuous mental health services since 1978 at the site? You know what? It's really been since 19... I, I had it in my draft and then um, I don't know what... I, I think I took it out at some point or maybe Edwin did in, in the draft. Uh, but yes, I had since 1968, full disclosure, I worked uh, for Heritage Health and Housing since, you know, for about 12 years on a consultant's basis. Mm -hmm. And they have been around that long under different names. Uh, so I think that that would be important to add in because um, mm -hmm. it goes really far back with uh, William Hatcher and Emma Bowen been stalwarts in the area of mental health and fighting for that uh, and even for getting the, the location. Yeah. So there's a lot of history there. Absolutely. Okay, so I, I will add that in. Um, thank you for that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Who was that, by the way? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Andres. <laughs> uh, oh, Andres, that, okay. That <laughs> is, it's an excellent point because it was in the our initial uh, draft. It was known as Washington Heights, West Harlem, Inwood Mental Health Services. Long name, and then it got changed a couple of times. Yeah, there's so much history there. Uh, quite a bit. So I'll make a historic reference. Okay. Anything else? I think it looks good once you make those edits, Laquita. Mm -hmm. You and Edwin. And then uh, uh, overnight, we'll try uh, to do it. I know he had to jump off. He, he couldn't speak anymore, but uh, uh, he and one other person losing their voice. But anyhow, uh, maybe overnight we can make these corrections. I'd like for, you know, I would just email it to uh, uh, Sydney, Barry, Liz. So it could be shared also at uh, uh, mm -hmm. Executive Ooh. and all put together. And then again, if any of our committee or anyone else uh, sees something there that they think should be, you think should be added, doesn't have to be fancy, just, you know, get it emailed uh, off tonight, you know, just address it to us and uh, we can input it or find some place, you know, for it to, to represent us. Okay. He added, uh, Laquita, he added some, Edwin, some additional stuff. Oh, with, I guess you will. Edwin. He'll yeah. share with you. <laughs> okay. Let me go. Let me go back. Can you read it, Monique? Uh, he, he wrote, uh, to uh, be, be it further resolved that the per, uh, pers preservation and enhancement of mental health services in our community be a top priority throughout the redevelopment process with no compromises or cuts to these essential services. Okay, let me, yeah. I'll try to get to that, make a copy of it, let's see. Uh, okay, yeah. Because uh, we stopped, I mean, there was so much, uh, so uh, a lot did get edited. Uh, okay. Yeah. But then I think that's it in terms of additional comments. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, actually, uh, Barry, since you're on, uh, um, are they coming before us again um, to present? I believe they're coming to housing the second Tuesday. Okay, next week? Yep. All right. 
I'll see if I could try to sit in. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be um, uh, a notice, a Zoom notice going out, but I uh, we can make reference to that tonight because yeah. we it should be there. Okay. Barry, any other thoughts? Your wisdom bringing coming to the uh, coming to us with this. I don't think I have that much wisdom to offer, um, but you, you had know, a lot. You had a lot. So I think that uh, I think that you know we're this is the month where we're going to take a position on this proposal, and I haven't seen many changes from the initial proposal that would give me any confidence. You know, I, I think that um, I think that not much has changed since September when we first found out about this from Andres. Oh, hmm. that's, and that's what's made that's it so case. difficult. Um, you know, even trying to put questions, they kept asking for more questions, put the questions in writing, and they were always the same question, as I understand it, every time there was a session where they, you know, presented. And so the questions never got answered. They were always put forth and never seemed to be answered or else they brought up about another question. Yeah. Well, hope springs eternal and we have to work at it. So um, I certainly appreciate the work, Barry, you and uh, the Landmarks Committee and, and the community at large, really, it's the community at large that has, you know, brought it to our attention and really been fighting against it in the best way they know how. That's right. And, uh, you know, so uh, we have to, you know, we're representatives of the community and, uh, and we live in the community. So, um, you know, we just have to keep, uh, the struggle continues. That's what it is, the struggle continues. All right, um, so we'll uh, close out on that for right now. We'll polish up the resolution and um, our draft as we'll continue to call it. And uh, I'll look to hear anything else that might uh, you know, come from you by telephone or uh, email. And as I look through uh, the updates, uh, moving right along to conclude, um, just today, uh, actually it was yesterday, another email went out to Mount Sinai. Uh, they have some project coming up. There's you know, one reason or, or another that they haven't set up a meeting, but uh, I just uh, directed an email this yesterday morning stating that you know, why don't they come up with a date that they're that fits the people he wants to assemble and the designated committee um, related to pediatric, the protocols in pediatric uh, psychiatry, um, those that want to meet on it uh, and need to meet from our community board uh, will find ways to, uh, to, make, to accommodate that so that we, you know, I wanted them to know that the community is still, um, asking about it, particularly the parent uh, who's still, you know, very concerned, obviously, and we just didn't want this to fall through the cracks. Um, so we're still working on that. Um, and I believe that uh, we've had an update on the other, whether it's commercial trucks and resolution, 5G resolution, um, the other things maybe we'll report on later. Now, typically this would be our last meeting, um, but I have to say that um, I'm hoping that we can meet another time um, in strategic planning, uh, an idea to revive the health forum, health fair came up. So um, we have, uh, Heritage Health and Housing willing to provide its doctors. They also have a person uh, ready to work with us on putting the fair uh, health fair together. We talked to uh, Basha, uh, who's written a book on uh, that's environmentally focused, who is working with us. Same with WEACT, 
And the concept is to have tables uh, where there are some uh, groups or persons with specific issues that can be addressed one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, along with uh, clinical, medical, uh, on the spot, um, heart rate, check, heart check, um, a high blood pressure that is, uh, hopefully also checking, uh, able to check one's uh, blood sugar levels, uh, whatever uh, can be done on the spot, uh, maybe possibly a van. Then it became the, pro um, the issue of the location. So thanks to Heather, uh, who's on our committee and she chairs uh, parks and, and landmarks, she gave me the phone number of uh, a person that I talked to and I talked to, actually there are several people I talked to. So we're looking at Riverbank State Park uh, if we're lucky, maybe I asked if the end of June was available. I, they didn't get back to me on that. Uh, so I'll just have to hopefully uh, get back to them tomorrow and just press the issue, uh, possibly for the last Saturday, um, last one of the last two Saturdays. June seems to be a very short month. Otherwise, uh, perhaps a time in July. Uh, but uh, on the environmental end, we had wanted to present um, uh, one of the topics for a town hall that came up uh, would be presenting what are what are you going to do um, if an emergency happens this summer, dealing with heat extra exhaustion, that kind of thing. Uh, and so taking more separating the medical issues and the environmental for pre for the. Uh, purpose of presentation. Um, and we were looking to do it at uh, Columbia's um, forum, but uh, we hadn't gotten any feedback on that, except that uh, the space is very hard to come by. But I think we would even be pleased with uh, Manhattanville School or um, City College. So we just have to look for another location. So those might be events that come up end of June or in July. And how opposed would the committee be to a July meeting? It would have, it would not be of course the first Monday of July if our events happen to fall in the month of July. Yeah, I mean, July seems more like a likelihood than June since June is here. Um, right. So it might be, so that might be uh, tough, but then, you know, July, I mean, July, I guess with enough notice, people should be able, I hope to join. There'll be people, there'll be people in the community for sure yeah. and at the park. So that could be a possibility. So um, we'll see, but, uh, and then, you know, I was working on several things so that I didn't push calling um, and getting the statement out to uh, the leader, the executives at Riverbank as I would have liked. So hopefully tomorrow we can change that. Are we looking to have it outside or inside? Um, well, I, I think a combination, probably if we're doing the uh, little table discussions or maybe, maybe um, part outside, part inside. Well, the only thought I had, and it's great that Heather was able to secure River uh, Riverbank. Um, well, she hasn't secured it, but she gave me the contact, so that's a. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> but I was but I was thinking about the form again because it is the between the form and the space that plaza area that's out you know behind um, Columbia, and it being easily accessible because you get off the train and it's right there. Right. Why mm -hmm. that would be ideal if we could, you know, get Columbia on board to allow us act to access the plaza, maybe the forum as a backup or something if the weather is inclement and and that's it. And maybe trying to get it in July could work. I think it's looking like July if we're gonna get this done uh, or just use another facility. The riverbank um, again would be good because you have a natural audience of, of people Absolutely. there, you know, uh, as well as we could promote it. Right. Um, and uh, 
maybe even well city college if you know, poss could possibly work too in terms that, of yeah. uh, people being able to gather you're right so we'll That's just uh, i'll have more time to you know put into it and welcome any of the committee's uh uh input and i'll have to call on you a different one so that we can you know help you know share the share the duties Right, you know, in in putting together our first, uh, and hopefully there's still budget. I hope I'm not too late. You know, it'd be my fault if we're too late. You know, I tried, but I have to present something, and it's and, I've been kind of like swamped to tell you the truth. Spending the money has to happen soon, but maybe holding the event can happen if you know what your needs are. Right, that's the main thing too. Um, uh, finalizing the proposals. And Odette has had her head, her hand raised. Yeah, I was gonna say, who oh, is gonna pass her hand up. Oh, who is that? O Odette? Oh, you know what? I was gonna call on Odette um, once we finish this part of the discussion. I did see a, uh, I did see something in the chat. Thank you though for mentioning it again. So, uh, you know, I'll call on everybody. I'll email the committee. And you guys are always so great about responding right away. So, um, you know, I'll wrap it up at that. And let's just see what I can get out this week, maybe before executive on, uh, on the presentation of the budget. And I will certainly email it to the committee. Okay. Uh, so that's two things, the resolution and the budget of uh, the uh, activity. And uh, so Odette, you are back. Um, Odette Wilkins is with Link 5G. And so you wanted to add something to what we had spoken of earlier dealing with Link 5G. Yes, thank you very much. I, um, I've been busy preparing for the June 7th hearing. And so I just wanted, I know that that was already mentioned to you. There's also a rally. There's gonna be a rally at 11 a.m. on the steps of City Hall. And uh, we really would love to have a large attendance there. Jerry Nadler is gonna be there, Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine, Julie Menon, Keith Powers, Christopher Mart, uh, council members. And so we're, you know, and Carnegie Hill Neighbors, which is the big preservation society on the Upper East Side is also gonna be there along with the other preservation societies. It's really important for there to be a big cross-section from around the city. Now, I wanted to know, are you going to be coming and testifying, Laquita? I will not, but you know, and I, and it seems like Edwin will not be available either, but I'll see who we can possibly get or have on our committee. Maybe we could put some notes together. Is it virtual testimony or it has to be in person? It can be virtual, but it's definitely more powerful. <laughs> If it's in person. in person, I know years ago I did I uh, did something with um, in terms of uh, uh, Carol with Carolyn Kent, but that's really going back at city, at city council, and I was one of the presenters. But anyway, I let let's see what we can do. Right, because it's going to be a big rally, uh, so that's going to be really fantastic. And um, and for, I know that Barry is the chair of your board. I don't know whether Barry can make it. <laughs> I, and Barry is on tonight. I don't want to put him on the spot. <laughs> but okay. then, when but Barry, the can handle, Barry, Barry, are you? <laughs> when is the hearing again? <laughs> it's uh, Wednesday, June seventh, and you would yeah. be terrific. Yeah, it's at two, right, or two thirty? So it's one p.m. It starts at um, one. And OTI is first going to be presenting. So I'm I'm expecting that the community members are going to be peppering OTI with a lot of questions, particularly in light of the letter from the Federal Communications Commission back in April, yeah. saying that notifying them that they were not they had not complied with federal law when they already started constructing the towers. So it's going to be um it was going to be quite exciting and it's and also the following week on july 14th there's going to be a listening session by new york state i think that one is in person that's going to be in harlem on 145th street and st nicholas avenue oh and um yeah and that is being sponsored by silicon harlem by New yeah, York that State. was mentioned. Uh -huh. Sue yes. mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Right, Connect All, uh, New York State Connect All, 
And I think there's a third uh, party that's also sponsoring it. And it's going to be at Silicon Harlem's headquarters. So it's going to be quite exciting. The that one is at what time? That is, oh, that's a good question. I think, I think that one starts at 2 p.m. I see. Mm -hmm. So wait, I'm sorry, 141st Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. Is that what you said? Yes. So is that the church? No, that is no, so that's at the Harlem School of, of the Arts, 645 St. Nicholas Avenue. And that's from oh. 3, to, 3 to 8 p.m. Okay. 3, 3 to 8 p.m. I'm sorry. I thought it was and actually, it was Quick emailed, question. everybody. Uh, it was emailed uh, to you on Friday. So if you can check your Friday email for me, there are two flyers. And it does help a lot of times, if uh, especially the significant uh, events like this, if uh, they're spoken of, because uh, sometimes the flyers become, you know, we get so much uh, email, but it is in your email packet, you know, not so much a packet, but it was emailed to the committee. But Barry, would you be available on this Wednesday, June 7th? You would be perfect. Uh, I will um, try. Um, I will know. I mean, I would be, I'm at work Wednesday, so it would have to be on Zoom. But, you know, those hearings, if if the if OTI is um, speaking first, I don't know at what time they'll take public comment. Mm -hmm. Right. Good question. At what time is the rally? It's at 11 o'clock. Okay. It's on the steps of City Hall. Now, uh, Barry, now you can also submit written comments as well. And the written comments uh, can be submitted up to 72 hours after the hearing. So that would bring it up to uh, about 1 p.m. on Saturday or past 1 p.m. I don't know when the hearing would end, but it's 72 hours after the hearing is adjourned. So that would be really great if you can, if that can be accompanied by, uh, if you're, if you're. Well, we can all help Barry with, with that part. Oh, not that he needs it, but, you know, just to give input so he doesn't have, have to feel like he's doing everything. <laughs> okay, well that, well, that would be great because uh, when I, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there in person. And I, we already have 16 community boards that have voted for either disapproval or moratoria. And that represents a huge portion of New York City. Because if you look at the number of community board members just for 16 community boards, that's about 800. And then when you look at who you all represent in terms of the number of people in New York City, that's on average about 2 million. That's mm -hmm. only a quarter of the population in New York. And there's still more community boards that are looking at this and are considering disapproval. So that's a huge number. And if I'm gonna talk about that, it's not going to have as much of an impact if the community boards themselves don't show up. So- It's just the time of day. I know yeah. the time of day is terrible, but- And some people, and like everyone's not in town and you know, yeah, then I, I'm not in town right now. So yeah. that's, that's where the issue comes up. But you know, we, we can see, but it'll be great. Yeah. Like I said, Barry is well versed on it and uh, he represents us so well and yeah, well, you know, knowledgeably, knowledgeably in so many areas. So it'd be great if he could. Yeah, but Barry, you wouldn't be alone. We'll help write something if it's 72 hours after. Okay, very good, excellent. Um, and then also we're putting together town halls. We're going to have a series of town halls. I, I was hoping to have started it a couple of months ago, but with everything that was going on, it was a little bit difficult. But we've already have confirmations with uh, some very prominent people in, in this area. And uh, I'd like to have the town halls every couple of weeks. And I was hoping to get community board sponsorship for these town halls. We have, um, I, I didn't realize that the community boards went on vacation for the summer, but maybe there is some way, Laquita, if I send you the description of the, of the speakers and around when we would have them, there might be some way of just circulating it around. Maybe we can combine it with, uh 
one the environmental forum that we were hoping to do, um, you know, as part of our budget uh, request. So let's do that and see how how everything falls, and maybe that could be one of the presentation uh, one of the presentations. That would be great. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And also, I it may have been mentioned, uh, but I just want to make sure that you know that um, there are three, right now about three towers that are still on the OTI data set for an adjoining community district. And that's Manhattan Community Board 7. And on the Northern border, which is which then borders your district, there is one that's planned for installation at West 108th Street and Broadway. So that's a little bit closer to your district. And when OTI presented at Manhattan Community Board 7 last week, they said that no towers are slated to be installed as of yet in um, Manhattan Community Board 7. However, they are still on the data set. They've been on this data set since I think, I don't know, December or January. So they haven't taken them off. And Gail Brewer, council member Gail Brewer, asked in a letter for OTI's written confirmation that there won't be any towers placed in Manhattan Community Board 7, but OTI did not respond in writing. Instead, it was an oral presentation by, OT, by, uh, by City Bridge. So we don't have any um, confirmation in writing, but it's still on the OTI data set and it does border your area. So if you do have any influence or any contacts with Manhattan Community Board 7, you might want to reach out to them and see about they're also disapproving the towers. Otherwise, you're going to get towers on the, on the southern end of your district. You may get south. You may get them on the southern end of your district. Mm. Do you know anyone? Community okay. Board Seven that you can talk to. I have to think about that. But I don't know who's on seven. I have to think about that. Yeah, because it adjoins you, and it doesn't help your district if there are going to be towers placed right close to your southern border. That doesn't help your residents. So might be good to reach out to them. Um, a very nice district manager there and uh, very friendly. Who's the district manager? Uh, I believe it's Maxwell Van Der Vliet. Oh. Very nice fellow. So I'm sure he would. All right. Any additional information out there? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you came back to um, fill us in. And uh, so maybe we could talk on, well, Wednesday is it? Maybe we could talk on uh, tomorrow at some point. I'll, you know, we'll see. Just yeah, as a follow up. But, uh, that would be fine. And also tomorrow I sent, um, I sent you an invite to a Tuesday meeting that I have regularly on Tuesdays at, um, at one o'clock and uh, to talk about um, the hearing on Wednesday and to talk about what, what we points we wanna cover and that kind of thing. Okay. I'll see if someone, I have a one o'clock, but I'll see if, um... I'll see if I can change something around. Then we'll see if there's, is there anyone else on the committee who might be available to listen in um, at one o'clock? It, it's usually, it didn't last that long if I remember correctly. It was about uh, the one meeting I was able to attend. It was like one to one forty-five, something like that. I'm sorry, it's at two o'clock. Tomorrow's meeting is at two o'clock. I apologize. It's at two o'clock. And it only lasted, well, that meeting that I did uh, sit in on uh, was from something like 2 to 2.30, 2 to 2.45. 2 to 2.45 or so. That might be a little bit longer just because we're trying to figure out what, you know, what the plan is going to be on Wednesday. But uh, it would be great 
to have people from your committee come on. Absolutely. Is there anyone who uh, may be available at that time tomorrow to listen yes. in at least? No, I already sent a note to Odette, Aloquita, because um, I, I guess I signed up to try to go to those meetings, but I do have a conflict. So okay. I'll, try, I'll try to be mindful if I could pop in. It may not be. Well, there'll be meetings. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. There'll be other meetings. Uh, um, I'll just, I'll see Odette what we can do. I'll reach, I have to reach out to our committee anyway on no, with you know overnight on a couple of other things so we'll see who may be able to uh, awesome. listen in that's fantastic thank you so much all right thank you and so at this point uh we've covered much of what we have to cover with the updates um so with our committee and and i really appreciate the majority of people hanging in there with us until it was time for our updates uh, we can entertain a meeting to adjourn unless there's uh, addition, any more business, any old business or new business that has to be has to be brought up. Any? Okay. So, um, is there a motion to adjourn? I move for us to adjourn at nine o five. And second. I'll second it. Who was that, Patricia? Patricia. Yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, we have uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> We're all tired now. Okay. Thank you so very Let me, uh, Edwin, I know he, he can't speak, but before uh, you cut us off, let me just make sure I check the chat. Uh, um, all the, uh, welcome to uh, Clotilde Mangua, a new committee member. She has her information in the chat. And Sharon um, De La Cruz was here also a new member. So I appreciate uh, right. both of you coming and uh, maybe you'll consider uh, the health committee among your choices, uh, committee choices. Welcome. <laughs> Let's see, Clotilde. Well, Sue, Sharon left some time ago. She put something in the chat that she was signed, uh, uh, that she was leaving. All right. Good meeting. Thank you guys. And we'll talk soon. Okay. Good night, all. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Let's see. I think. Thank Edwin, you. Okay. Let's see. Edwin will turn us off. Yeah, save it to the cloud. Uh -huh. <laughs>